Welcome to Let's Chew the Gum. I'm your host, Protocol. We talk about a lot of things in this show while we chew the gum. And as always, on each and every show, we always have something for your mind. Welcome back to the latest edition of Let's Chew the Gum, the podcast where we talk about everything from A to Z while we chew the gum. Some folks ask, why do we chew the gum? They say you can't, you shouldn't chew gum and talk, but we believe differently here. We believe that chewing the gum gives you a bit of a focus and a rhythm and just makes for a better overall conversation, whether you're talking or engaged in sports, it, it just helps. So that's why we chew the gum. Please take a listen to us on other platforms. If you're listening on Spotify, check us out also on Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, Spreaker, Breaker, Podbean, and others. Also on YouTube. Feel free to submit questions to the show or topic suggestions at let's chew the gum at gmail.com. I want to jump right into our conversation today. We have a special guest today. Our special guest is Dr. Carrie Yazid. She is a former social worker turned business strategist. And we're talking today, we've been doing a series on implicit bias and racial awareness. And today's show will be uh, in that vein. And so we want to get right uh, down to this topic. But first, let me go ahead and, and have her say hello to you guys and introduce herself. Dr. Kerry, welcome to the show. Well, thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. absolutely. This is a pleasure. <laughs> No, absolutely. You know, I've, I've followed your your accounts on uh, on LinkedIn for quite a while, and, and I love the, the work that you do. And um, I wanted to bring you on because I appreciate the insights that you have and, and, and what you provide to others. And so I wanted to bring you on because in, in light of what's been happening throughout our country uh, with racial insensitivities and, and individuals striving to, you know, some of them are striving to become educated on, on how they can help while many of us are striving to get away from and eliminate the experiences that we've been going through and that others have been going through. And so we've had to sometimes, for lack of a better term, clap back at others that have, have come for us in certain ways and also to let people know that this is as a serious situation. And so um, recently you, you had an experience and I wanted to bring that to the forefront uh, for our listeners and then also just talk, have a talk in general about the need for racial awareness and the need to eradicate uh, anti-black racism. So if I'm not mistaken, recently uh, someone approached you in an in ordinary way and in, in perhaps an offensive yeah. way. And, and so let's let's talk about that. What What's going on? What happened? Um, so basically, this was um, someone that I had connected. Well, they had sent me a, a request to connect back in October of 2018. So big time gap. Um, and since that time, we had never communicated again on LinkedIn. So the connection request was on um, LinkedIn. And basically um i guess they were offended at some posts that i had made so one post that i had recently put up was that um white people needed to stop reading white fragility and i gave a list of other books that i thought they needed to really start um engaging in and reading if we're really going to have a serious conversation about changing the racial climate that has taken that has been in america for Century, so it's not like this just started. But you know, if you if we're really going to start changing things, if we're doing things, I don't think reading a book that continues to pacify you and make you feel good about you know things that you've done throughout the ages that have worked to oppress a certain group of people. I just don't think that's it. I think you need to read books of, from people who have actually had those experiences 
lived those experiences, have done the research on those experiences. So I don't know if it was that post or some other post that I had put up about like racism and things that were taking place with um, small business owners, because that's what I focus with. My focus is on. And so the message that she sent me uh, was, why don't you, why not, why not help all women? And that statement came from, I work with black female entrepreneurs. I work with black women who are looking to build and grow um, businesses. And so that was, she was taking a jab at me for like the tagline for my business. And so it caught me off guard because, A, I had never interacted with this person outside of sending a welcome email back in October of 2018. Um, so for that to be your response to me, you know, almost two years later, it's just like, okay, wow. And so my response basically back to her in another message was that I don't owe you or anyone else an uh, answer or an explanation as to why I have decided to work with my own people. I don't owe you that. And so I hope that you have a great weekend. And that was my form of dismissal. Like this is over with, we're not having, we're not doing this. Well, evidently my dismissal was not what she wanted to hear. And so she really went in. Like when I say she went in, she went in. And it got real ugly real fast on her part. Um, basically, she said that I wasn't a Christian, that God was not happy with me, with the decisions that I've made, that I'm discriminating, and that, you know, we don't like to be discriminated against, meaning black people, but here we are discriminating against people like her, and she really looked up to me, and she wanted to work with me, but now she saw that I didn't care about her, and I don't care about white women, and it, it just went on and on and on. And she went on to tease me and to say that I was limiting um, myself. And that meant that I wasn't making any money. And that, you know, because I'm only working with one group of people, which then, okay, you don't know about target marketing and that everybody has a niche. And if you're trying to serve all people, you're not making any money. So as she sent me all of these messages, um, and then she went on to tell me that I didn't know her. I didn't know anything about her and that she was going to show my messages to her black relatives. So, um, so we went from Christianity to I, to I have black relatives to I'm making fun of you. You're not going to make any money and you know, you don't know me. So as she sent in the messages, well, I got on my computer and I did a nice little Google search, which revealed to me that she owns a multi-million dollar business. She owns a staffing agency that has several locations throughout Ohio, Texas, North Carolina, and Atlanta, Georgia. So I'm small change. You don't look up to me. You never would come and work with me for a family business that your mom started in 1980. Right. And that everybody in your family is eating and benefiting from that. So at this point, I just told her to smile because I had taken a screenshot of the entire conversation. And I also told her to tell her black, tell her black relatives that I said hi. And then I asked her to please leave me alone because I felt that her messages had be, were a form of harassment. I felt that she was threatening me and I felt unsafe. And so when you start to use those those words um, with someone like her, well, we all know how that shifts real quick and she becomes a Karen. And so then it became, she started to cry victim and say that she felt that I was harassing her and that, um, you know, I was discriminating against her. I made her feel unsafe. And um, she was going to take screenshots too because God forbid how I was going to use them. And I was like, you can do whatever you want. And so after that, she went on to block me on LinkedIn. And so when you block someone on LinkedIn, that means that I would no longer see her picture in the messages, nor would I see her name. That would be erased. Um, and so I think she had really bargained on that. I was bluffing and I hadn't screenshot everything. 
but I had screenshot everything. So I had her name, her first, her last name, her picture. People could go and look at her profile to see that she does own this multi-million dollar staffing agency where her family owns it, that she's the regional vice president, and that, yeah, she doesn't like black people. How about that? So she just t- took it upon yeah. herself to, based upon what she was feeling or going through that day or particular time, to jump into your inbox about your personal preferences of, of who you're working with and who you're trying to support. And and then to be, be, then to berate you, torment you, tease you, ostracize you, judge you, and, and then play victim to it all. Right. At the end, to, to play victim. And so, um, as I, I've stated this before, people who know me and who've known me over the years, I am very, I'm really an introvert. So on social media, it looks like I'm not, but I really am. So I, I mind my own business. I don't bother people. Um, you know, if you stay out of my way, I'll stay out of your way. But I am also that person that, although I am well educated, I grew up in the hood. So, you know, my family's straight out the country, sharecroppers. You're just not going to handle me any kind of way and think that it's okay. And I don't care who you are. So when I told her that I had screenshots, I I was very honest. And when she said, you know, as I'm Googling to see who she is, and she's like, "You you don't know me, you don't know who I am. And I looked at my phone and I said to that message, I said, but you're about to find out who inbox you just jumped into because mm-hmm. you're about to find out who I am. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> no, that's that's uh, I, you know, I just I don't I, I don't understand the, the mindset and I'm not going to try to understand the mindset that she had to, to <laughs> take, an, take an action like that and to not expect some type of repercussion. Perhaps it's what she's used to doing. And perhaps it's what a lot of folks who are or can be oppressive or or look at you a certain way down, look down their nose at you, what they're used to. People that have been in traditionally in in positions of of power and authority uh, can be abusive Mm -hmm. of that power, can be dismissive of individuals that they think are beneath them and then don't expect some repercussion. Because perhaps yeah. historically they've had law on their side. Historically, they've had the systems and the institutions on their side. And so that, you know, that for me, that brings to mind a, a whole nother idea of of the systemic uh, racism that that exists that, you know, has served to protect people like that from their actions where there's no repercussion. So they think it's OK and, and that they have leeway mm-hmm. and license to act however they want to act. And but what you're saying is, is not today, and at, le- at least not this person, right? Yeah, no, not not no, not today, not this person, not in my lifetime. Like it's just not going to to happen. And I really didn't care who she was. And even at that point, when I saw that, yes, yeah, she she's working with a couple of millions. You belong to a yacht club. You have some other things that you could be doing besides jumping in my inbox to berate me about my business. Absolutely. I I can I can't imagine if you the the reverse, if you had jumped into her inbox and berated her about her business or her privilege, et cetera, et cetera. You know, as and 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 just listening to it, I don't even think that would be something that you would even think about, because there's so many other things that we have to occupy our, our minds with. You know, that's that's one of the things. Yeah. And, and and I don't know this person, but I'm just speaking in general. That's one of the things I don't understand about racism or racist people. I don't understand right. how you go about your day filled with so much hate and animosity. I don't understand how you go out and I use this phrase a lot. How do you go out and have ice cream with your family and smile? But at the same time, you have this anger and hate and disgust inside of you. If, if someone that doesn't look like you comes into the into the room. You know, I always believe that when you eat ice cream, it's a happy time. And I, I just don't understand the, mm-hmm. the, the mindset. And, and I've, I've only attributed it to either uh, a fear. Um, I've attributed it to an insecurity because somehow you believe that something that you think you should have is going to be taken away from you. When in fact, the, the systems in society are mostly set up to benefit you. So I, I just don't understand. I don't I don't I don't understand that I'm not. I'm not built to understand it, but I do understand the the uh, 
inequitable situations that that cause individuals to be I don't want to want to use the word victimized, but I want to say be affected and to have them uh, lose out on opportunities because people like that exist in positions of power where they're able to dictate to a sense uh, someone else's ability to, you know, rise above, whether it's economically, socially or social mobility. I know in the conversation that I was listening to you have on another show, you were talking about the idea of your parents having the wherewithal to live where they wanted to. But because of redlining and other issues, they couldn't, you know, so it's those systematic yeah. situations, institutions and policies that have that have served to undermine the, the equality that she is trying to s- suggest that she's preaching to you about. <laughs> but she's benefiting right, from exactly. them. Exactly. Yeah. Right. So she has she has benefited. You know, my thing is if you have a staffing agency and you have all of these different locations in different cities and states. Then, you know, usually when we talk about staffing agencies, you are working with people who have a hard time getting a job. They are usually going to be minorities. And so your family has become multimillionaires off of the backs of minorities, probably, probably black, looking at the cities that her staffing agency is located. It's, it's uh, you know, how- She's maybe looking at you. You know, I've seen people with this attitude. How, how dare you try to be excellent? How dare you pursue that dream? You know, why aren't you underneath me? You should be working. And she's saying working with you. She may have been thinking you need to be working for her. I, I don't know. I'm just saying what? I've seen that type mm-hmm. of mentality. I, I've, I've seen it a, a thousand times. You know, let, let's. Right. And let, so, and I think we we all have seen, but I think we all have seen that. So it it doesn't come as a surprise. So I I don't know if she was expecting the element of surprise. It, you know, I live in the deep south, and when I say the deep south, it's like the Mississippi River is about a mile from my house. You can't go any more south than that. So uh, I'm I'm not sure what she was expecting, but I'm not surprised. I wasn't surprised at her behavior. And I, I have interacted with people like her before. And I think, if anything, that was the element of surprise with how I handled her in the end. Sure. Absolutely. No, it prob- probably wasn't expected because and, and I don't know, you know, uh, what she what she, again, thought to gain from that or, or what you know reaction she thought that she would get. But sometimes people become a little flippant and they, again, they get so used to dealing with people who, you know, when you're in positions of power like that and, and you wield so much authority and, and the type of business that she's in, and I don't know her lifestyle again, but you start to think again that you can talk to anybody anyway, because you have become accustomed to people kowtowing to you because they are in need and they feel they you, you know, they feel as if, you know, they can say whatever they want because, you need them. And if they aren't somehow in your life or a part of your life that you're going to be less than or you won't be able to obtain what you want. Hence the comment that she mm-hmm. made about, you know, you don't know who I am. And if you knew who I was, you know what I mean? And you're not going to get any business and, you know, that type of deal, you know, so right. she, she was feeling herself. She was doing something. I don't know. Right. You know, and, and I, I appreciate the, the fact that in the articulate way that and when I say articulate, I don't mean in the way that some people say, oh, you're so articulate as as, as that's sort of a microaggression. But I, I mean, just the way that she did not expect to be uh, have a reply sent to her in, in such a manner. Right. And, and I wanted to talk a little bit about this environment that we're in now where, you know, mm-hmm. people are sometimes still afraid to speak up and speak out. And a lot of people haven't found their voice. And and I'm glad that you do have your voice and you use it. You know, what, what would you say to individuals who are in similar situations, but they're afraid to speak up because some type of power is being welded over them, or if it's their landlord or if it's their boss or some other employer or someone in the community where, you know, they are living under discriminatory situations, but they haven't spoken up. That's been something that's historical and it's not across the board, but there's still lots of pockets where that's happening. What what type of advice right, would you give right. to those individuals? Um, I would say I would say this. It was actually I was listening before I did my interview um, with um, Carol Sandy um, on the um, mental health roundtable yesterday. Um I had actually listened to an interview with um, Dr. Joy, who is the author of Post-Traumatic Slave Syndrome. Right. 
And one thing that she talked about, which I've done it, but I never really put it like in the context of what it was. And it, it, what it speaks to is that finding your voice also means that you have to understand the value system. And so when it comes to African American, our value system is based on our families, is based on relationships and those people that we care about. So we really value relationships. We take relationships to heart. Right. But when we look at our white counterparts, they don't value relationships. They value objects. They value things. They value money. And so when we look at the history of um, lynching, and so lynching was a way to take away those relationships from us. So if your relative is hanging from a tree, that relationship has been stripped from you. That means part of your power has been stripped from you. Well, when we're dealing with white people, you have to remember, again, that they value things, objects, and money. So then you have to figure out, how do I strip them of that? Because it's the same effect that we had with, with lynching. They have that same, it has the same impact on them. And so this is where when you find yourself not having your voice, I always say someone is over you. Let me speak to your supervisor. Let me speak to your boss. If I don't like the way you're handling me, I'm not going to deal with you. I'm going to put my complaint in writing. I, we live in a digital age. I will screenshot it and put it all over social media. I, I am known for dragging you if you come into my space and you start messing with me, especially when it comes to racism. So sometimes finding our voice means that you have to realize what is that going to look like. And maybe the person that you think you're dealing with has the power, but they probably don't. And so figuring out where the power source really is and going to them. And when you figure out that maybe they don't want to listen to you, then it becomes, how do I take that power away from them? And so sometimes that means that we have to go to the media. That means we do expose people. Um, sometimes that means we're protesting. So our voice is going to look different for everyone. Everybody's voice is not going to be the same. But the common denominator that, that we all need to have is that when you are dealing with people who are non-black, um, especially white, that their value lies in, is, so it's objects, it's going to be it's power, it's money, it's things. Mm -hmm. How do you take that away from them? Definitely. Yeah, I, I'm a big proponent of, of that as well. You know, if, if I'm speaking to someone that's telling me no and I need a yes, I'm, I need to talk to the person that can tell me yes. And and, you know, we have these pseudo gatekeepers or people that are in particular positions mm -hmm. where they feel empowered, where they, you know, in, in, in another part of their life, they may feel oppressed. But this position or this title makes them feel entitled to wield power over others and, and sometimes to try to be the end all and say all. And I think historically for some individuals, when when you've encountered a wall or you've encountered a threat, um, a lot of people have tended to stop there, whereas others are saying, no, we're going to break through that wall, walk around that wall, go over that wall or re remove the wall in some way, because it's a realization that, no, you, you really don't hold that power over me. And and I think that's held lots of people back with just this perception that someone has this power or control over you. And if you speak up or speak out, there's going to be some detriment. And, and that has been the case historically when you're talking about lynching. But we're in a, we're in a different time. And so utilizing the tools like your voice, social media and, you know, I, I do some courses and, and classes on advocacy, teaching people how to advocate when there is a situation where you find yourself dissatisfied or there is an injustice. There's a way to get it done. And like you said, everyone's voice mm -hmm. is not the same, but everyone can participate and, and find a way to amplify their voice if it's through, you know, uh, through someone else that has a voice. But learning how to advocate and to be able to speak up for yourself. And like you said, in referencing to uh, Dr. Joy is understanding your value. Because, you know, and, and for me, like you say, with the relationships, for me, a lot of the 
situations I found myself in in my life where there's been oppression. For me, the drive has been relying on even thinking about those relationships, the individuals that have fought for me to get here, ancestors that have died and paid the price. And, you know, so how dare I shy away and back away with all the things that that they have gone through for me to be here to have this voice. So, you know, if we don't push it forward, if we don't amplify it, if, if we don't continue to move it and, and make new targets. And, and as you said, um, as you were alluding to before, understanding our value, you know, that that will serve to really have a repeat of history to where we start to digress and we start to lose those rights. And, and that's something that I don't want to see done. You know, be, before we, we came on, I had mentioned that um in this whole light of, of what's happening with George Floyd and, and, and others across the country, all so many, too many names to name. I've told folks, this is not the time for us to be an event. And as a black male, it's not the time for me to be. I don't want to be anyone's flavor of the month because it's a trend, you know, so I appreciate, you know, everyone mm-hmm. that, that's putting up the Black Lives Matter and, and different corporations that are. Um, whether they are are altruistic about it or or whether they are doing it for the promotional value or to be current, you know, it's more than just some words and some names, you know, so we're looking for, for action and we're looking for meaningful change and not to the detriment of others, right? It's not about others have to feel some detriment or some loss. It's the fact of, you know, there needs to be some, some common sense, ideas about humanity and and what it means for individuals to be to have equal rights and equitable situations so you know is it a revolution i don't know if it's a revolution but it definitely needs to be a change yeah but i think the thing that we have to keep in mind too in being realistic is that we are now asking we're asking whites in america so we're going to start with america um to unpack over 400 years of slavery and you know and we haven't been out of slavery that long but oppression still continues so you're asking them to unpack all of that to change a system that has benefited them and a system that was built to benefit them not a system that was built to benefit us and i think that's problematic in itself because when you really think about it Is that really going to happen? You're asking me to let go of power that I have held all these years, centuries, that have allowed me to sustain my lifestyle. Um, I think we see we're getting a lot of lip service right now. Um, I see monuments being taken down. Like you said, you know, we become a hashtag and right now it's just a hot, hot topic. But do I see this lasting? And my answer is no, I don't. And I think the reason that I don't see it is a twofold. I do see we have whites who you are asking them to let go of a whole lot. That's a lot that you're asking them to let go of. But we also have blacks who have benefited off of that same system under the table. And if we're asking them to come to the table and stand up for us and be a voice for us and to help us in this fight, in this movement, what we're going to see, and I've seen it based on this situation that I told you about earlier that happened on LinkedIn, I have had Blacks to tell me that I need to be quiet, I need to move on, I need to let that go, that my behavior has been inappropriate, um, and that that's now how, that is not how I help Black people. Wow. So, yeah, I, I, you know, and that doesn't shock me either because I've met those type of Negroes as well. Um, and so you just you 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 read them and you move on. You call them, you call it like it is. You tell them who they really are. And they usually back up when they see that you see who they really are. Right, right. Yeah, the, 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 those situations definitely exist. And, and you you make a good point, you know asking people to give up something that has benefited them for so long um, as a system, Mm -hmm. as a system that that's Mm -hmm. benefited them for so long. And then, as you said, those that are indoors at the table, so to speak, who are benefiting. um, I I think you made a comment the other day that, you know, they, they be quick to slam the door behind you because, you know, they, they're on the inside, you know, they, they, they are uh, tokens for lack of a better term but i don't i don't mean tokens Mm -hmm. what i what i mean is they have benefited so somehow you know 
I saw a movie years ago. I, I forget what it was, but they were talking about protests and particularly the black protests with the Black Panther. And the guy said, well, you know, what happened to the movement? You know, and he says, well, the brothers went down to protest, but they were hiring that day. You know, so people got jobs and then they became complacent. And so, you know, but mm-hmm. the idea is that that didn't change the structure and the system for everyone. Right. Um, and so we have to right. definitely be aware of, of those small tokens of, of you know, uh, of the crumbs. You know, I was speaking with a, a very intelligent woman the other day, and I, I'm not going to mention her name because I, I didn't tell I was going to reference this. But we were talking and she had mentioned about, you know, I'm tired of having or begging for crumbs or waiting for crumbs when we should be baking the bread. You know what I mean? And and so that that's that's a, a whole nother factor there that we need to consider. You know, I like to, I like to believe in democracy. I like to mm-hmm. I like to, you know, as as a as a as a philosophy, I think is great. One person, one vote, majority rules, you know, and, and there's some opportunities for everyone to have their say. And when it comes to this situation, this wave of change that we're facing in terms of Black Lives Matter or just inclusion, uh, uh, equality, et cetera, you know, it brings to mind. And I've been telling students this for years. You know, this is the reason why you have so many states and so many leaders who are trying to change laws on voting, you know, because if if we if we do have a democracy, but just somehow eliminating the voters that's just another way to reinstitute the institutions that have benefited folks for a long time. <clears throat> and so it's difficult right. to see this change coming while at the same time, you're talking about making change, creating change, proper legislation. But then you see so many states where voter restriction laws are happening. And it's mostly uh, uh, to the detriment of, again, minorities and individuals who want to seek these changes. And so, you know, a big part of what, what has to change is, is people, again, have to know how to use their voice. They have to, to know how to advocate and they have to be aware. You have to be aware and be able to, you know, uh, manipulate or, or, or go through the media to find out, you know, I always say follow the money. You have to be able to go through and find out what's what's really going on, because if, if we can advocate all we want, but if somehow we don't we aren't able to vote or our vote doesn't is not being counted you know, it's easy to say, well, you know, the majority said that they don't want change when really they did. But, you know, so much of of the of the individuals who would make up the majority were having silenced through the vote. Right. Let's uh, take a quick break. And when we come back, we're going to pick up right here from where we left off. We want to take a quick break and uh, give some time for our sponsors. We'll be right back. Something for your mind. If you haven't heard about Anchor, it's the easiest way to make a podcast. Let me explain. It's free. There's creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. Anchor will distribute your podcast for you so it could be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many more. You can make money from your podcast also with no minimum listenership. It's everything you need to make a podcast in one place. So what are you waiting for? Download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. Carry a Z. We'll continue our conversation. You know, it's it's I think that the change that we're looking for is is going to be if it is to be one, it's going to happen on multiple fronts. And we're going to need individuals from all aspects of, of life to to continue to contribute. And it, and it needs to be sustained. You spoke in, in an interview I heard you on and you were talking about how racism is exhausting and it so is. Yes. And, and and that that's so points to the fact that we need to bring others in and, and train up our young people, those that have the energy to not only work with us, but to continue the, the work on those days when we are tired, because it is. I have a colleague who, who called it uh, similar to uh, uh like a post-traumatic stress syndrome or battle fatigue, because you, you deal with this on a daily basis, far beyond the microaggressions. I'm talking about the blatancy of racism and it is exhausting, but you can't give up. You can't quit. And so that's sort of what we pass down to our children. Um, you know, it, it's the generational um, uh, oppression that, that we feel, but you know, where do we, what do we do, doctor? What do we do? What do we, what do we do? Um, I think, you know, when we talk about like racism being exhausting, you know, one thing that we have to remember is that we do have to practice self-care. 
you know, and I talked about this, is that, you know, sometimes we have to take a break from um, the tools that we use to fight oppression um, in today's society. And a lot of that is going to be digital media. So it's going to be us using the Internet. It's going to be us using social media. Sometimes we have to take a break from that. We need to plug back into the world around us. And that means going outside, interacting with people, having conversations with your family members um, face-to-face versus you're doing all of this via text message um, and and engaging with what's going on. Sometimes, you know, taking a break and just sitting outside in your backyard and doing absolutely nothing um, because you have to recharge. You can't just keep going and going and going. I also say, too, that All of us have different battles that we are fighting. And so I'm very adamant about what I will come to fight for. Um, Some things I'm not going to fight for because that's not my battle. That's not my ministry. And I understand that. And so I might be supportive in other ways, but I know that I don't have to give all of these different things 100% of my energy and my time. But that means that I'm also not going to go in and berate another person because that is their ministry and that is what they do. I might just say, how can I help in another way? It might be me giving something financially. It might be me sharing a post or an event that they have going on with my audience. I can help in other ways because I know that what I have to fight for, which is going to be black women and women who look like me, that's who I'm going to bat for. And that's who I've always gone to bat for. So knowing when to put your energies out there, when to reel them in, and when to recharge and when to take care of yourself. And, you know, and, and, and that's on a spiritual level. That's also on a mental level. So I do advocate every black person needs to go to therapy because you got some stuff that you need to unpack and leave right there and and walk out the door with a fresh start making sure your health is okay so going to the doctor making sure you have your regular checkup eating healthy um you know exercise and all of those things they help you to recharge so that you can go back out there and fight these battles right yeah we are very very well very well said absolutely i i agree i you know i asked that question because you know myself and i know others that that feel like you know if they aren't doing the and engaged in the fight and they aren't doing the battle that somehow they are slacking or somehow um the battle is being lost or no one else is going to do it and so you know you have many people in situations where they feel as if if they don't do it no one else will and if they're not doing it somehow they're they're letting someone down and and you know you, you do have to recharge and and um it's it's for some people more than a notion, but I, I'm glad that you brought up the idea of, of therapy for people to be able to unpack, to be able to recharge, because I think that's something that folks also need to hear when you're engaged in these tough battles, particularly this fight against racism that, you know, you, you have to find your way. And just as I said, you know, individuals who are racist, I don't understand how they smile Well, people who are fighting against it sometimes find it hard to smile in situations. Um, but but it, it's it's possible. I'm, I'm glad mm-hmm. I'm glad that that we we're able to to have this conversation. Um, you're listening to Let's Chew the Gum, the podcast where we talk about everything from A to Z. You can find us on most podcast platforms, including the one where you're currently listening. In addition, we're on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, Spreaker, Podbean and so many others. Today, our guest is Dr. Carrie Yazid, and we have been engaged in a great discussion about finding your voice, having your voice eradicating eradicating systems and and modifying power and and also being able to sustain those fights um, with our most recent comments on therapy and and mental well-being i i want to con- continue um this conversation and, and i don't want to i don't, I don't want to keep you too long because I, I know that you have uh so many other things that you could be doing but i'm glad you're here with us this is important i i wanted to continue this conversation because earlier you had mentioned about um, folks to stop reading uh, white fragility. And I, mm-hmm. I, I have to, I have to put my hand up and say not guilty. Uh, I'm not, I don't feel guilty for reading the book. I, I've read quite a few books from, from the author and, and some of her books 
we utilize in uh, at the university where I teach for the teacher education program. And I, I understand exactly where you're coming from when you say you need to stop reading books like that. And let's just face this thing head on. Let's, you know, hear from, mm -hmm. you know, don't don't sit back to where you're comfortable because the book does make it. It is I think it's designed purposefully to make individuals, particularly white individuals, feel comfortable about comfortable about where they are. And it uses right. language to sort of ease them into this idea that, you know, you should change or you could change. And here's how. Right. And at the same time, you know, it's, it's, it's when uh, others were telling Dr. King he needed to slow down in the movement. And he was saying, wait a minute, you know, it's easy for you to say slow down and, and take these small steps because you haven't been victimized and you haven't been affected by these systems for so many years like we have. So there's no time for for slowing down. So so I get both sides. And so um, I'm, I'm saying and, and proposing or asking you, you know, for individuals who uh, you might seek out to become allies and particularly white individuals that you might seek out to be allies and, and some that are not ready for the in your face. Here's what it is. Here's the history. Look at this right now. And you should change. You know, how do we how do we bring individuals along or, or how do we meet them where they are so that we can, you know, so transform or, or build alliances? How do we how do we do that as opposed to um I don't want to say as opposed to I'll just leave it at that. How do we do that? If we if we were saying don't read white fragility, stop reading books by these particular authors and read these books. What about the folks that, that may not be ready for those? Well, my thing is this, you know, we we tend to even as blacks, we tend to underestimate the intelligence level of some of these people, mm -hmm. um, because if you can sit down there and you can read white fragility um you can read anything so it's not that you can't comprehend and it's not that you can't digest the conversation is that you don't want to because see blacks have been forced to do a lot of things that we don't want to regardless of if we are emotionally ready or not and so when we start to talk about the DNA makeup and, you know, who is human and, you know, and they say there's only one human race. Well, if blacks can be forced to do things that they haven't wanted to do for thousands of years, then guess what? Whites can do the same thing. So when you sit down and you read a book like White Fragility, it is because you want to be comfortable. You really don't want to be an ally. You want to be a part of the hot topic. You want to say that you read a book and that this is what you're going to do and you're going to do this in a moment. And then 30 days later, you're going to go back to being caring and screaming at somebody because you don't like what they did because they are black. You're not, you're not, it, you don't want to change. So it's not that you're not ready, it's you don't want to. Mm, okay. So I'm 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 sorry. I'm not that person that's going to say, well, you know, how do we how do we, you know, work with them when they are not ready? You're never going to be ready. So this is when you learn how to swim and you keep saying you don't want to do X, Y, and Z. And then the pool, the, the swimming instructor just pushes you in the pool. You going to swim or you going to drown? Which one you going to do today? And black people have been doing that since we got here. Definitely. No, that, that, that point is, is well taken. I, I think about, you know, I've heard individuals tell me, uh, I've had individuals say things that were racially insensitive. Um, in the past, for example, I, I was called a, a nigger by, um, years ago in the military by a guy. And at the time I was, you know, fresh out of the hood myself and I was, you know, ready to fight. You know, I grew up through segregation and race riots and, and didn't like that type of thing, never understood it. So before I could, individuals intervened and kind of asked him, hey, why would you say that? Some of his white counterparts, why would you say this, that or the other? And he had the the uh, mindset that he didn't know he did anything wrong. He said, I didn't, I didn't know that was mm -hmm. wrong. And I'm thinking, you know, how could you not you know, know that's wrong? You know, I'm not buying it. And he said, no, I, I didn't mm -hmm. know I, I, I did anything wrong. He says, where I'm from, and it was some city he named south of Houston. This is back in the early 90s, some city south of Houston. He said, where I'm from, we call black people niggers. They call us crackers, and, and that's just how we grew up. I didn't know that this was wrong. And I'm 
so I'm trying to give the, the benefit of the doubt. And, and the only thing that made me sort of believe that may be true and uh, was the fact that, that there was another racial encounter I had. This was in Florida at the time. And uh, when people found out about it, he was the first one to show up at my door with his shotgun to protect me. Right. So did he have a change mm-hmm. of heart? Is that what he truly believed? Is that where he really was from? And that was just how he was raised, but he didn't know any better. You know, I, I don't know. I know that he, he showed up. Um, that doesn't mean that on another particular day, if we're in a different environment and he's around those people he grew up around and I happen to be there or some other black person happened to be there, that he wouldn't have a different attitude. I don't know. You know, it's hard to to judge those situations. And so that that, you know, I, I heard a, there was an a, a, a author who did a, a, a performance in a, a play or whatnot. But anyway, she was talking about, you know, her reticence or her her uh, uh, lack of trust to, to cross the aisle to shake the hand of a white person. She said, because every time I do that, it's like I'm crossing, you know, fields of broken glass to try to reestablish and reach out to trust you again from all the things you've done to me uh, and, and that caused me to distrust and and it's like, you know, I'm thinking in these situations where we're, we're making changes, obviously we need allies. Nothing can be done on its own. You know, there's all people at different levels of understanding. And it's, it's such a complicated situation. You know, it's a complicated situation to try to figure out, you know, who is sincere and genuine, who really wants to learn. And, and for the most part, who doesn't know? Right. Because I, I know for any of mm-hmm. us, we, we only know what we're, what we're taught. We, we, we know what we were taught. You know, racism is taught. We know what we're, we're taught. And, and until you encounter a new situation, a new paradigm where you can shift, you know, so I tend to I don't let people off the hook. But if someone is telling me, well, this is how I grew up or what I knew. OK, OK, you, you get that one, not even a pass. You get that one, mm, not even a chance, but you OK. But now that, you know, from here on out. There is never another opportunity that you will have to backtrack. And and if you do, then then that that gives me the evidence that I need to know, because, you know, when it, it's like with, with my children, I always said, you know, they've never gotten in trouble for anything that they did wrong. If it was a mistake that they didn't know better. But once you know and you know better and you make that mistake, now you've made a conscious decision. You were consciously aware of your actions. You were consciously aware of your thoughts and you went through with it to perform whatever act. And and so, you know, it's it's a it's a tricky, tough situation. But I I definitely your point is well taken about folks that, you know, you don't want to change. You want to say you read a book. And and I definitely doctor, I definitely know quite a few people that way that just want to say I read the book. Um, um, Mm -hmm. years ago, I had a, a a situation in a a district where I approached the the district officials and said, Hey, this district needs some racial implicit bias, overt bias, racist training for teachers and educators. And I was told, well, we, we had the uh, Ruby Payne training. We had a training on that, you know, as if, you know, that was enough. You know, so I've always said that one training, one hour, one day is, is never enough. It has to be sustained. But the point was, when I went and asked other people in the district about it, none of them could remember that training. You know what I mean? So it's we, we have we have lots of, of work to do um, in, in this realm. And uh, I, I like engaging with individuals like you because we need all of these perspectives and we need all of these experiences because, you know, they're all valid. And I, I just um, I just wonder uh, what what uh, alternatives, if you have any, would you say, for example, if I want to do a community book reading and I want to uh, bring uh, white colleagues into the fold, um, what might be some alternative approaches? Oh, that's the hard one. I'm, I'm, I'm you know, honestly, I'm not sure. Um and I think for me, what it takes is that I really need to, I have to get to know people. So I'm not just inviting anyone into my camp. I need to see how you move. I need to see what you've done in the past, because just because you say you want to be an ally now, you know, really allies have always been allies. Like it, it didn't just start. 
Um, and so everything that they've done, everything that they, you can look at their history and see that they've always been a part. They've always been involved. Like I had a classmate when I went to LSU and we're still good friends till this day. And she's done like so many different things, um, been involved in like different marches and protests and movements. And whenever I have like an event, she'll show up with like about 10 other people. And, and she's just like, hey, I brought you some support. You know, and it's like, how did you hear about this? And she'll be like on social media. And so she, but, she, but she's been consistent in everything that she's done throughout all the years that we've known each other and we've known each other for like at least seven years but 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 her her pattern has never changed what she stands up for has never changed she's never wavered but it didn't just start like today and I think I noticed her in class because she spoke out about something that happened and I was just like wait hold up girlfriend you kind of cool and we fell out laughing you know um and so I'm leery of people who now, all of a sudden, it's, I want to be involved. I want to be a part of the movement. You know, you got to be careful because, er again, everybody's not our allies. Some people are there to spy on us and to see, you know, what it is that we're doing so they can go back and report. Again, things have not changed. I, I, I tell people slavery has not ended. It just looks different in a digital age. No, oh, that's that's a, that's a great point. So so in essence, you know, you're saying that, you know, she's your colleague, your friend. She's putting in the work and, and the work is yeah, her she's evidence putting in the work. Right. She's putting in the work. She put in more work than we do sometimes. Right. Like, because I can be like, oh, wait, that's going on. And she'll be able to break it down, tell you what's going on. Like, I've seen her put herself out there on the front line. Um, when her black co-workers wouldn't, she would be the one who would stand up for peace. Actions, actions, not words. No, that, that's a great point. And, and I've often told, you know, individuals, you know, the, the best thing you can do is put in the work and not rely on your, your black colleagues and friends to educate you about it. Because like you're saying, if you were an ally, you were you were already an ally. If that was a part of your makeup, that's, mm -hmm. that's your makeup. So we can look at at your track record to see that. Now, that, that that's a great point. I'm, I'm glad that that you that you brought that out. So, you know, that that's uh, makes quite a bit of sense. Um and it, it, you've just, um, you know, turned on a, a light in my head for a, another project that I'm working on that it'll be interesting to see how that turns out. No, that, that, that's 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 no, yeah, absolutely. That's that's been great. You pro definitely provided our audience with some great insights. And, and I appreciate the conversation that we've been able to have today. Um, before we end this off and um, let me ask, are there, are there any other items that we haven't addressed that you would like to bring up for our audience to know? Um, no, you know, like if people want to follow me, if you want to know more about who is this lady, you know, what is she talking about? What is she about? Um, I, I always invite people, you can follow me on social media. LinkedIn is my biggest social media platform. That's why I do the most on LinkedIn. Um, and then Instagram and Twitter and across all of those platforms is going to be Dr. Kerry Yazid. Um, please feel free to visit my website, which is thebeautybrainsandbusiness.com. There you can check out my podcast, um, subscribe to the YouTube channel, and just see the different things that I do for black female entrepreneurs as it pertains to helping them to build and grow businesses that they love. I'm really, really active um, and just, you know, that's my passion. That's my ministry. That's what I do. And no matter where you follow me, it's going to my message is consistent and I stay the same. That's out, that's outstanding. Well, we definitely appreciate you here on Let's, Let's Chew the Gum and, and taking your time to uh, to uh, speak with us and, and share your insights. And I look forward to more. And I'm definitely, you know, we'll have all of uh, Dr. Yazid's information in the uh, on the podcast uh, uh, description. So be sure to, to do that, to follow her and to check out all the great work that she's doing. It's, it's really been a pleasure. And I, I thank you so much. Well, thank you for having me. And, and, and please hold on. I'm going to, I'm going to end the show, but I, I'd like to speak with you a little bit after we, after we finish this. So this has been let's chew the gum, the podcast where we talk about everything from A to Z. 
And as you've heard, our guest has been Dr. Carrie Yazid, former social worker turned business strategist. And we will have all of her information in our description of this episode. And remember, we always have something for your Bye.